Thank you to Jan Gamekeeper for requesting this episode. Welcome to Reform Review, the show that gets facts wrong about your favourite language reforms. I'm the casual Conlanger, and in this episode we'll be looking at Benjamin Franklin's phonetic alphabet, or Bufpa for short. That doesn't sound great, but I'll figure something out by the end of the video. Born in 1706, Benjamin Franklin was a founding father of the United States, a polymath, and most importantly for us, a spelling reformer. He proposed his phonetic alphabet in the mid-18th century as a global spelling reform for the English language, though some reform purists might argue that it isn't one in the truest sense. We'll see why in a moment. It predates the IPA by over a century and reveals several differences between 18th century and modern English pronunciation. First, graphemics. Franklin's alphabet removes six letters and adds six custom symbols, which goes beyond a small minority of reformers' definition of a spelling reform, but personally, I think it counts. Showing these added letters is a bit difficult in practice, as they're not supported by Unicode. Thankfully though, there are a few documents on the Wikipedia page that we can use for reference. I'll have to use a few provisional ones that somewhat resemble them, namely Latin Alpha, Heng with Hook, Eta, and Armenian Eni. Let's IPA the FPA and have a look at its phonology and orthography. The OA ligature stands for or, upturned H called a uh, represents a, uh, ing for ng, eth for the, eth for th, and ish for sh. The last three all resemble the letter H, likely to symbolise the digraphs they replaced. Spelling is mostly phonemic, and we'll find out why in a minute. So, the consonants. The first thing to note is the lack of the wine whine merger in the reform, meaning words like which and whine were distinguished from which and wine by the pronunciation of wh, which would have roughly been hua for Benjamin Franklin. This sort of distinction is somewhat rare nowadays, but was relatively widespread in the 18th century, so its inclusion is unsurprising. Just to clear things up from previous videos, I won't be analysing hya as a phoneme anymore. As some of you in the comments pointed out, it's wrong. However, I will maintain H as a marginal phoneme, which was left out in the reform. The reform has no distinct graphemes for Y and W, opting to use their vowel equivalents instead, sort of like classical Latin. This is pretty unintuitive. Take how Julius or Julius was spelt during Caesar's lifetime. It's quite confusing if you're not used to it. Let's turn our attention to this bizarre looking cell and try to understand what's going on here. The first letter is called long S, which you may have seen in very old texts and signs in England, and is originally the first first half of est set in German. It went everywhere except word finally, where a small s was used, eventually abandoned in printing and type foundries by the 19th century, and in handwriting half a century later, so we'll just use small s for clarity's sake. Remember how I said that spelling in the BFPA is mostly phonemic? Well, s was used for s, and sometimes word final z, and that sometimes gives us the opportunity to look at some morphology. A morpheme is the smallest abstracted unit of meaning in a given language, analogous to phonemes, which are the smallest smallest abstracted unit of sound in a language. For example, the word unbreakable contains three morphemes, un, break, and able. Since it can stand independently in a sentence, break is called a free morpheme, whereas un and able, called bound morphemes, are dependent on free morphemes to keep their meaning. Morphemes can be written in the language's orthography, the IPA, or even glossing abbreviations for clarity, and they often have several different forms called allomorphs, like the distinction between phonemes and allophones. For instance, the English plural suffix morpheme, s, usually written as z, has multiple allomorphs. It becomes is after sibilance, devoices to s after voiceless sounds, and remains z elsewhere. An example of each of these is kisses, cats, and dogs. In this letter written in Franklin's alphabet, oh, bit bright, there we go, the cases where it's pronounced s or z are written as s, but is is spelt is or iz a bit arbitrarily, and while we're at it, some words such as to and be seem to have multiple spellings. If this doesn't scream confusing and difficult reform even for eloquent English speakers, then I honestly don't know what does. While we're still on the topic of morphology, also notice the very Shakespearean apostrophe d past tense morpheme, which represents t and d after voiceless and voiced phonemes respectively, and occasionally id. I actually quite like this feature, though I'm not getting nightmarish flashbacks to secondary school English classes, so that's probably why. You might be wondering why I'm rambling on about morphology so much. Well, a worthwhile advantage of incorporating some morphological spelling rules into a largely phonetic reform is that it can heavily simplify inflection and derivation. Okay, enough with morphology, back to orthography. Ish is used in all of these graphemes, which is a neat feature, but makes me question the choice of I for yod, since sh could have been written s-ish with yod as ish, although its name would probably need changing. Feels like a missed opportunity to improve internal consistency and maybe make the spelling a bit more intuitive. Alright, consonants done. Let's move on to vowels now. 
This table is messy, and for good reason. The few examples of Franklin's alphabet are all rather inconsistent spelling-wise, and different sources have made varying analyses of the orthography, so I bundled them all up in one and, well, it's clear that Franklin didn't spend much time on the vowels when creating the reform. Above all, it's vague. With one or more phoneme assigned to each grapheme, these choices complicate the vowels just as much as they simplify them. It doesn't get much better with the diphthongs. Given how old the reform is, I can cut some of Ben's decisions some slack. For instance, the choice of EE -E for A, which was probably pronounced more like E or E in the 18th century, but that's just about the only positive thing I can say about the diphthongs. They're appalling. Like, how is OA R I? a good representation for oi. I just don't know. Why is the r in i represented differently from the r in ow? Now, admittedly, the vowel choices could be because of his accent, but that would make them diacentric. Every way you look at it, for what's supposed to be an intuitive, global spelling reform, the vowel graphemes are the total opposite. As always, let's look at the reform in practice. Pause the video and have a go at it, and let me know how you did in the comments. Kensington, 26th of September, 1768. Dear Sir, I have transcribed your alphabet, etc., which I think might be of service to those who wish to acquire an accurate pronunciation, if that could be fixed. But I see many inconveniences, as well as difficulties, that would attend the bringing your letters and orthography into common use. All our etymologies would be lost. Consequently, we could not ascertain the meaning of many words. The distinction, too, between words of different meaning and similar sound would be useless unless we living writers publish new editions. In short, I believe we must let people spell on in their old way, and, as we find it easiest, do the same ourselves. With ease and with sincerity I can, in the old way, subscribe myself. Dear sir, your faithful and affectionate servant, M.S. Speaking of subscribing... Actually, never mind. Only 11 of the 112 words remained untouched by the reform, and some of those were just the inconsistencies we already mentioned. Implementing this reform would require completely relearning the spellings of over 90% of English words. It certainly would have had a better chance in the Age of Enlightenment than it would today, but would have required far more backing than it received. Benji's alphabet is a bit of a mixed bag for me. It does have some good ideas, the mostly phonetic orthography, the addition of letters to tackle some of English's defective spelling, and we can't forget that it's the only a priori spelling reform so far to have addressed morphology. Nevertheless, the illogical vowel grapheme choices, the inconsistent spelling, and the sheer amount of relearning required to use this reform are simply too problematic to ignore. I guess the too long didn't read of this review is, Benjamin Franklin was probably better at founding America than he was at reforming English spelling. But hey, that's not so bad. All in all, I like Benjamin Franklin's phonetic alphabet more than I like parallel English, but less than I like cut spelling, making it my third favourite global language reform so far. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time, where I'll be reviewing the Apanda reform. It certainly would have had a better chance in the Age of Enlightenment than it. Sorry.